Wait, nope. Now we are live on all of the social media platforms. What is going on, Internet? Happy Tuesday. How are we doing, guys? I don't know where to look. We're filming on so many different devices. I'm not even sure who to talk to. Doug, can you hear us okay? And plus, type in chat uh, in the Zoom room if, if we're coming through okay for you, brother. Should we tell the wonderful people what we're talking about today? Yes, we shall. I, I'm sure everyone mostly is just here to yell at you for your very strong opinions on how Novak Djokovic is the greatest tennis player of all time. And, and they probably arrived here and they're like, oh, God, <laughs> they're like, oh, God here we no go. Again. More Novak yeah. Djokovic. Yeah. Cool. I don't know that I would say that they were strong. They were just, you know, I mean, I, I looked at data and from an objective standpoint, I'm, I'm just gave the facts. Yeah, and you're a Fed fan too. That was probably very hard for you. Oh, dude, yeah. Um, um, we probably should tell. So guys, it's been a minute since we've been in a live stream. A lot of things going on at Player Court. You may notice we're in a brand new office. Yeah, indeed, yeah. not bad, right? Um, I have a brand new child, so it looks like I haven't slept in two months. It's because I haven't slept in about two months. But uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so we took, we took the month of October off, but we are back, Adam, and get ready because you're going to see some serious content coming your way uh you probably noticed yesterday if you caught yesterday's video nate on the youtubes talking about how Novak we can Djokovic wrap up is the greatest tennis player of all time so get used to that on mondays we'll be talking a lot more about what happened make sure you never miss anything that happened uh on the pro tour over the weekend and i'm trying to think what else for those of you who have never been here before um these live streams technically are for our plus members our plus members are here on a separate screen here um through a Zoom link, and they'll be able to chime in and ask us questions, turn their camera on, we can see them, they can see us. So if you're not a Plus member, be sure and check that out. But otherwise, shall we dive right in? Talking about perfecting the uh, the two-handed backhand it today. It is yeah. all about the two-handed backhand today, which fittingly, we, we have Novak up because he currently has the best backhand, two-handed backhand in the world. Man, we have some arguments. This, this, is just, uh, this is just the week where Nate proclaims that Novak Djokovic is the best at everything tennis Yeah, related. no, I don't... I, I don't believe that. I, I would still say just better player of all time, more talented. And, time. Uh, just data is data, right? As Diane and Pat stated, that it needs more data. Well, That's we right. have the data. There's a lot the data. of data supporting after Paris and, and Novak winning his seventh, well, his proclaiming the world in number one for the seventh time. There's a lot of data supporting Novak. Um, but the two hander is a big reason as to why he is as good as he is. When you have the best backhand in the world, you don't mind an inside out pattern and you don't mind pes pesky lefties and some Nadal's patterns, right? So, what we're talking about today are sometimes some of the misconceptions with the two hander. We're going to take you step by step on what you need to do on your two hander um, in, in order to optimize it, to take it to the next level. Do us a favor, too, just to make sure you guys are all paying attention. Type I'm ready in the chat if you're ready for Nate to drop some absolute knowledge bombs on you about um, how to improve your two-handed backhand. Knowledge bombs. Knowledge bombs. Oh, we got a lot of people in the plus waiting room. We got a lot of you guys up, plus? in. Plus members, come on in. I'm excited to talk to plus. It's been a little bit, guys. We've been missing Yeah. And they are flowing into our plus chat room here. All right, here we go. Trying to admit all these guys as fast as I can. Just waiting on Scott, guys. Sorry. Something. Technology. You know, it's yeah. it's very difficult. All right. Let's get to it. We got a lot of people saying they're ready on Facebook and on YouTube. Sean, I see you. Anthony, Adam. Inside of our plus room, we've got Wendell. Uh, I'm going to butcher this name. Weridia, maybe? Arif, Doug. Let's get this party started. Enlighten us. Yeah. Oh, great backhand. Teacher. <laughs> so when we're talking about the two-handed backhand, what we first have to talk about is the grips. And so there's multiple acceptable grips for the non-dominant hand, but on the dominant hand, there's only one grip we really prefer you using, and that's the continental grip. Continental grip, you'll remember your index knuckle and heel pad is on bevel two, like so. We're all pretty familiar with the continental grip. If we're not, we've got a ton of YouTube videos about the continental grip. Check that out. But you really want to make sure the dominant hand, your bottom hand, is a continental grip. Now, your top hand, there's some variation. What we prefer is either an Eastern forehand grip or a semi-Western grip, all right? So for the Eastern forehand grip, it's the forehand that we see Fed using, right? What do you use? You use an Eastern? I use an Eastern, which is what? The greatest tennis player of all time. Not Novak Djokovic. Juan Martin Del Potro. <laughs> so lame. All right, but the, so those are the grips that we want to focus on. So Novak, obviously continental 
with his bottom hand. And what we'll see on his top hand, it's closer to an eastern forehand, but it does list a little bit. And so what we're talking about now from the grips, now that we have the grips, let's go back for just a moment and put some emphasis on what's happening in the ready position on the two-handed backhand. You'll notice that his hand is up on the throat. As of late, it's been a little bit closer uh, to the grip, a little bit further down. But the reason this ready position is important is that he's still centralizing his forehand. Regardless of how good his backhand is, he always wants the opportunity to hit a forehand when given the chance. We'll talk about high level versus maybe not so high level as far as ready position too, right? Yeah. As far as yeah. like the big shift down, we'll, we'll get there. Yep. So what we're going to move into now from the grips is the first move. And the first move is the unit turn. And the unit turn is the when you initiate getting your body sideways. But what you're going to see here is that when Novak initiates his unit turn, it's also when he makes his grip change. Oh, Got to get this circle straightened out here. Talk to me about this too. So for two-handers, as I'm initiating my unit turn, what what is the first piece? Is this hand is leading? Is it hip? Is it shoulder? Like what? For us rec players, what are we thinking about to yeah. initiate this? It's thing? a great question. So from the ready position as a righty, as my left hand begins to slide down, as I make this turn, it's really my left hand that is doing the work. And I'm I'm using my torso, using the core to go ahead and get coiled here. And this happens seamless. So from a forehand grip, as I see, recognize that I'm getting a backhand, as I start to turn, I'm going to change grips as the, at the same time as I'm turning. We'll go back and I'll just put make sure that you can really see that with Novak because I do think this piece is important. You can see there in his ready position as he begins to turn, you can see his chest facing us here. He then gets through the unit turn. And this is where we can see that he's completely sideways. And so a really good hallmark of a good unit turn, and this is a good measuring stick for you guys, is to make sure that your chin is over your hitting shoulder. So sometimes we see players, I'm showing you as a lefty, obviously there's not a ton of room over here or on the other side. But so sometimes what we see is players taking the racket back here or here. And what you'll notice is this divide between my chin and my shoulder. And this is problematic because we're not getting a full coil. I want to make sure that I'm getting all the way here to where my chin is directly over my shoulder to get that for full unit turn. We talk about that on the follow through too, right? From maximum power, we're looking for shoulder over shoulder, which I know we'll get into. I am going to field one question here from Giovanni because I think this is one that I, a lot of people probably have right now. Do you leave a gap between the hands or have them touching together or is this personal preference? So do you want to start and then I can step in? Sure. I think a lot of it, it's, it's, it's depending on how big the gap is. It's personal preference. If there's a slight gap, that's fine. Uh, we have a really a, a good friend that plays at a 5-5 five, five level that keeps his hands a little bit apart. But what you're going to see most of the time are the hands touching. You're going to see them. But if you have, if you're playing and when you switch your grips, when you get here, if you're staying here, that's just too far. Yeah, that's right? what I was going to talk about too in the ready position. So there's going to be different instruction for different levels of play here. If, if you're advanced, it may be very comfortable for you to start with your hand up here on the throat and make that transition down as you shift into your unit turn. If you're finding that you're fumbling to find your grip, and you're missing a lot of backhands, or maybe your backhand is, is you know, your glaring weakness and you just need less things going on there. We will have some of our rec level players, you know, even, even up to like four oh four five sometimes when they're struggling with the backhand, start in ready position with their hands together. And that does not centralize the forehand, but beggars can't be choosers, right? If yeah. you've got a weaker backhand, sometimes the only way is to just get rid of the extra, and the extra would be that shift down that you're seeing Novak make during his unit turn, right? You got it. And the what is the advantage? Like, why why do you see players starting here, even with the two handers, like starting through here? And the idea is the spacing. When I move to my forehand, you can see I have this beach ball effect. Right. Where if my hands are here, you've got to do a really good job of getting the racket out and away. But you you play with your hand further down. Yeah, I mean, and you and do I'm, a good job of getting your hand away. That's the key. It doesn't matter. You just have to make sure you're creating the appropriate space. Yeah, because that's why the hands on the throat. If you can generate that on your own, not necessarily mandatory, right? You got it. All right. All right. Giovanni, so, I hope that helps. So with the unit turn, we've got the 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 grips, right? And it, it is important that we we know that the non-dominant hand is what changes the grip. I don't know if I mentioned that, but the non-dominant hand is responsible for changing the grip. Now let's go back to the first move here because the first move 
happens just a split second before the second move. The first move is with the upper body as it begins to turn. But what you're going to see here is the outside leg also turns out. So they have, there's a conjunction here. It happens together. The upper body leads by just a fraction of a second. But what is important on the backhand is to lead with your outside leg. All right, so this me... is big too. I would say most players that I coach not playing at a high level don't know this. They may they may happen to do it, you know, out of sheer luck, but I don't think most players understand that your first step is actually left. I think a lot of people think they're going to cross their body with their right foot for that first step. Yeah, and we see a lot of players side shuffling, right? They're here and they're side shuffling out to the ball, but the problem is it doesn't give you the space from the ball. You're trying to time it to where you're timing your turn and hoping that there's enough space. Um, uh, Scott and I are much bigger fans of stepping out with the left. And so what we're going to see here, I'll play through this for just a moment, is that Novak stepping left, the ball here is in his strike zone. So we're just seeing him step out with the left and then timing the right foot. But we're going to talk about in a moment what happens if he's on the run. By stepping out with the left foot, it gives him the ability to pivot and step in with the right foot or to adjust and to be on the run. But before we get there, we've got to talk about the power position. All right, so we see Novak on his outside foot here, and the power position, very simply, is keeping the racket above your hands. Okay, so we see his hands down here. Sometimes we see players taking the racket straight down, and they're losing a ton of access to power and spin because the racket being up here is what's going to create momentum. It's funny because everybody gets this on the forehand, right? Like all levels, we've all heard about the loop on the forehand or, or point your head guard to the sky to drop in and get that momentum. The same concept applies on the backhand. Do you have to loop? I bring this up because I, I do something slightly different, right? Where I kind of battering ram up into that yeah, position. You go right? like there's, a pendulum take back. Yeah, there, right. there is. Um, but the key is just to get here so that we can drop back in and generate that momentum, the same as we talked about on the forehand, right? That's right. And, and I mean, WTA, we see it different. You see a lot of the WTA players, when they're taking the racket back, they're here, right? Novak is low and then works at a high, but the racket's always up. And then you start kind of low and go back up to high. Right. Regardless is when the racket gets back, what we see here in this position, the racket has to be above the, the, the hands. So this is this will answer Sean your questions. Sean's watching us here on YouTube. Sean says is it important to keep the racket above the waist? Um, I tend to drop the head down, but feel I'm coming in late. So you kind of just answered exactly what he's talking about, right? As long as we get into that tip of the racket facing up, so that we can generate that momentum down, Sean, you're in good shape, dude. Yeah. Well, and another piece though, of why we want the the racket high is if the ball's coming in high, let's just put a circle there, right? We'll put a circle right here. Um, if the ball is coming in high. Make that circle bigger. It's going to be hard for everybody at home to see that. Yep. There we go. If the ball was coming in high, obviously Novak would be super late here, but I just want you to see if the ball was coming in at this trajectory and Novak started with his racket low, I'll just fast forward here. So you can see what I'm talking about. If, if Novak, you have to swipe up. Yeah, if he immediately started his racket in this position, the line now would work. I'll put the ball really where it'd be. His line now would be like this. And what's in, end up, what, what he's going to end up doing is either one, he's going to lift a ball that's already lifted, which means it's going to go out, or he's going to hood the ball. And hooding the ball is when your racket comes over the top of the ball, which puts it in the net. So if you're taking your racket straight back like this, this can be a problem. I know we see uh, Gil Simone, he takes his racket back nice and low, but he also takes the ball on the rise really well. But try to avoid this. So let's back it up for just a second. We were talking about the loop. So regardless of the loop, here we see Novak getting the arms away from the body. Elbows in a little bit, but the racket works away from his body. And now this piece is important. One, Notice how still he keeps his head. Throughout the entire movement, his head has stayed still with his eyes on the ball. And bonus tip, this is good for you as a one-hander, too. You think about Fed and how still oh, that head stays as his, yeah. as his body close through. And so now, assuming that his hands are relaxed, what's going to happen is that when his weight begins to shift forward here on his front foot, you can see here, as soon as that weight comes all the way there, the rocket now 
has begun to drop. All right. And this is where we're creating the lag. This is the lag where the racket's going to fall and enter the slot. The slot here to where the butt cap is a little bit perpendicular to the ball. And then this is the moment that is critical. All the magic happens. Yep. So the dominant hand, the hitting hand is passive. So what I mean here is from this loop, as he has weight has shifted forward organically, the rocket has fallen. And what you're seeing is the dominant hand being passive. So what does that tell us? Which hand is doing the vast majority of the work? This, this is huge, guys. If you don't understand this, if you're a right-handed player, your left hand is doing all of the work on the backhand. And, and the example I always give my students is if we were ambidextrous in a ground circle, rally, we may just have you hit two forehands. Most of us aren't. I'm not. I know, yeah. I know you're not either. So the bottom hand is really just on there for stability, right? Like if you yeah, ever hit your dominant hand, yeah. Right. If, if you ever hit as a right-handed player, a left-handed forehand, you can maybe do it, but it just feels really wobbly. Well, that bottom hand, your right hand going on bottom there is just for stability. All of the swinging is happening with your top hand, which for, for your right-handed players is going to be your left hand, and reverse it, obviously, for lefties, your right hand on top will be doing all the swinging. That's right. So passive dominant wrist, and then from here, the racket has the ability to create topspin. Because I think sometimes what players are trying to do is create topspin um, by really working with the, the you know, through the strings to the ball, but it's just the path. The swing path is coming from low to high, and it's not a ton. I mean, there we can see the rocket is slightly closed, not, not a ton, but because the rocket has worked from low to high, now he's imparting top spin. And here it actually looks like he's driving a little bit more. So let's talk about what's happening here at the finish. The weight has shifted. We can see his back foot up, so the weight has shifted to the front foot. And as the rocket lags out to contact, we're seeing contact just in front of his hitting foot, right? Just in front of the hitting foot. And that's where we want it. Now, there's going to be some preference here as to whether you're hitting with a bent elbow or a straight elbow. I mean, we can go late in here with straight elbows. We have, you know, the, the, the bent elbows that we see a little bit more consistently on tour. Um, here, Novak stays a little bit straighter, starts bent, but comes in a little bit more straight. Now, contact out in front, rocket swings out to contact. And then from here, you can see the rocket now works up, pivoting around the head. Now, here's the piece with making sure that you have followed through all the way that I think is really important. When you come through on your backhand, it's important that your left elbow gets past your chin, right? Because sometimes what happens is we see follow throughs like this. Right? And if you guys can see that out there, I'm a little jammed up here. But as I swing through, I'm just putting my hands on top of the racket to give myself some space. But if I come through here and my elbow stays on this side, my, my left elbow, it's not a full follow through. My left elbow needs to come past my head to give me this full follow through. You won't get that full extension doing that either, right? Like a huge consequence of, of an abbreviated follow through there is you don't get that extension all the way out. So your depth's gonna suffer, your power's gonna suffer. And this is what we were sort of talking about earlier with the shoulder to shoulder idea, yeah. right? When you're starting, you're thinking about looking over your dominant hand shoulder, some right hand, and I'd be looking over my right shoulder, steady head when I finish, following through looking over my left shoulder now. So the head sort of operates yeah. as the axis That's that right. our shoulders rotate around, eh? You got it. I, I, someone from Canada. Mm. So the other piece that people talk about all the time with Novak, if you have an extremely good follow through, which also means you have an extremely good contact point, that contact is happening well in front. When Novak's finished, he's showing his bicep forward. His chest is forward here. And then as it begins to coil, yeah. what you can see. Flexible dude is what you can see. Super flexible. But what you're going to see here is that the butt cap is facing the side curtain. And that is a complete, that's as full of a follow through as you're going to get. It's true. Um, We've got a lot of questions piling up here. Are you, are you open to fielding some of those before you carry on? Yeah. And I'll tell you what, while we're playing these, I mean, while I'm answering, I'll just let this play in the back so people can kind of see. I'll play it in slow-mo, guys. Let you kind of check out what's going on with the Djokovic. Back, Djokovic backhand. Yeah. All right. So we'll always go to our plus members first. Arif, um, Arif, I can actually unmute you and you can talk to us if you want to do that. I'll ask you to unmute. Um, if you're up for it, great. If not, just say so in chat and we'll answer your question. 
either way. Sure, yeah, we can talk. There we go. What's going on, man? How are you? All right, not bad. Thanks, guys. Howdy, yeah. sir. Happy hey. Tuesday to you. Yeah, Thanks likewise. For... Appreciate the session. So, yeah, I was working with a coach last week, and one of the things he pointed on my backhand was dropping. I'm left-handed, so he's like, for these dropping balls uh, that are low, and I know uh, you guys were just talking about the high balls. So for the balls that are dropping, where you have to kind of also reach uh, towards them on the run, he mentioned in order to go from low to high to accomplish that ground stroke, to actually drop my back leg. Uh, he talked about how a lot of the women on the court or it's on the tour, you notice them essentially like dragging their knee, getting to that really low position. Um, it's almost like a kind of gives you the torque to swing upwards. Um, so wanted, uh, that's something that was brand new to me. Uh, I started implementing that, saw some improvements. I uh, just wanted to get your take on that. We actually, we did a video on that. Same exact content. I like your coach. Love his thinking. We're talking about kind of organically producing the racket drop. And when your left knee, well, if I'm a righty, uh, for you, your right knee, as your back leg drops, it's impossible to keep the racket up, assuming that you're not just death gripping right. the racket, right? But from there, your racket's going to drop. So it's, it's fantastic coaching. It's a great point. Okay. All right. So just wanted to uh, confirm that with you guys. I paid uh, on on the right path over yeah there. no that that coaching spot on i'm sure your coach will be thrilled to hear that scott and nate from player court gave him the thumbs up now is it but, is it by chance a player court coach then we have to give him a raise that's right <laughs> uh yeah he is actually all right, right. yeah refer yes. you guys uh to me and that's how i ended up hearing about it, you guys and signing up over here very cool very very cool perfect well, circle that's anything, awesome uh anything else while we've got you live here uh let's see um Obviously, we don't want to talk about forehands. There's so many other problem areas, but uh, just sticking with the backhand, I think I uh, one issue was I was uh, not uh, holding the um, my right hand, and I was being on the lefty. I was holding it more on the throat uh, during the uh, stroke itself, and he made me bring that onto the handle, kind of what you guys talked about earlier, keeping that separation as less as possible, um, and I think that's uh, the right way to do it. So I've improved there as well. So. Uh, that resonates with uh, what you guys are talking about as well. Yeah, and that's your dominant hand, right? I mean, it's got to be on the grip because that should be doing all of the swinging, right? right? So as a lefty, your right hand on top should be doing all of that work. So, yeah, you can't, can't leave that on the throat. Um, right. I think the confusion there, even what you see here with Djokovic on screen right now, that ready position, if you feel like you're getting caught there, that would be one of the examples where we would maybe say, hey, for a little while, Start with your ready position, two hands close together versus on the throat. If you're not having problems centralizing your forehand, you can always drop that that grip down. Yeah, right. I know um, – I think a lot of people consider it like lower level. I mean I'm playing at a 5-0 if I lost 10 pounds, 5-5 level, and I, I hold my ready position, you know, fingers almost touching. 20, 20 pounds. 20 pounds. Yeah. But, yeah, there's nothing to be ashamed of there. The final thing was also keeping uh, the eye on the ball. I think that's the piece where – is it more advantageous to kind of, if you, you again want to play just the forehand, like similar to the forehand, you want a backhand to be played ahead of you, right? Ahead of your leading foot. Um, is one good tactic to kind of say, let me look through the strings. If I can see the ball through the strings, then you know you're always playing it ahead of you. Yeah, but you want to make sure that you're you're entering your unit turn as well, right? So like if I'm in, if I'm in this position and I start moving to the ball, I want, if I'm here, as I'm moving, we call putting shoes on the car. I want to make sure that I'm also getting here as I move. I want to I want to make that first move. Um, I think the important thing we'll see if we can see it here with Novak. Um, the important thing is if you're stepping out with your left foot, you always have his, your his eyes right, ahead. His right foot. For, his I'm sorry, foot. yeah. As a lefty, you'll be stepping out with your right foot. Your peripheral vision is always ahead. And then as you're turning, you're still keeping your head this way as you start moving out towards the ball. And we'll see Novak do that here. Um, so you can see, he. so here he's going to be on the run. This is good because we talked about this earlier. His, and we can tell this because how much how much more shallow this leg was on the turn because yeah, he immediately, up. yeah, he immediately needs to get out this way. Got to cover some ground. So from here, now he takes a cross step and see how his eyes have stayed forward the whole time. So I think the cross step is probably what you're looking for, initiating with that, 
that right foot, excuse me, initiating with your right foot and then going cross step. And then from here, he gets his outside leg behind it and he's hitting in an open stance for him. Right. But the, the cross step may be something that you want to talk to your coach about. Um, if you feel like peripherally, you're pulling off the ball, if you're sideways too early. But I think for forehands and backhand, the big takeaway here is you always step out with your outside leg. Yep. That keeps you forward as long as you can before working out to the ball. And gets that unit turn on time to make sure you're not late. I think a lot of players are like, oh, I, you know, I keep hitting the ball late. And they're looking in all the wrong places for the solution. And really, it's the racket prep coming back too late. Like, if the racket's still pulling back as the ball's coming in, there's nothing you could really do to be on time at that point. Right. So. Right. I think that's a key point that you guys mentioned. If you focus on that, uh, that leg stretching out, then and by f the physics of it, you've also forced ways to start moving. Yeah, uh, you got it. Kind of getting into that wider toric generation, right? That's yep. exactly right. Yeah, and there, you know, it used to be kind of prescribed that you know, stay, stay your first two steps, stay sideways. It's like it's just so inefficient, and what it like it keeps your eye on the ball longer, keeping your chest forward. But then you're trying to pivot and turn and find the ball at the last second, and spacing zone is always too shallow where you're jammed up, and that's a problem in itself. So I, I would start with the outside leg, and you'll be good to go. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, man, thanks. Thanks, thanks for tuning in. Course. Yeah, we appreciate it. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll get you on more of these. We'll be doing more of these now that uh, now that we're in the new office and now that I yeah. uh, off the court am a managing bit. two children more successfully <laughs> in my spare time. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you soon. Oh, great. Uh, I'm sure I'll have more questions later. Sure. Right. Yes, throw them in the chat. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm going to butcher this name. Is it Weradaya? I'm going to ask you to unmute here. I see your question in plush chat. Hopefully you can at very least tell me the correct pronunciation of your name here. It's Wilson. Perfect. That seems <laughs> no, way easier. You know. <laughs> Are you sure you just read that? How are you doing? Good, Good man. man. What's happening? Perfect. Well, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, private lessons, actually, uh, these past Oh, week. that's right. Yeah, very cool. Very, very cool. Well, thanks for jumping on the uh, on the live stream here. Is Wilson who's talking about coming and working with us a little bit? You know, we have a lot of people talking about coming to work with us. But sure. yes, Wilson, Wilson and I were chatting about potentially a little Virginia Beach training session. Nice. Um, so talk to us here. I see, well, I've got you live here. I don't need to reread your question. Tell us tell us what you're trying to solve here. Two questions. The first one, and I think somebody on YouTube also asked the same question. Uh, when you're doing the ready position and transitioning to your intern, where should your elbow be in the uh both hands basically uh, yeah i did see this it looked like hilton uh hilton henderson asked this as well you need to separate your elbow from your body on your backswing back question no so, yeah so, so yep. I, it's, it's the forehand but i, I just want to see a graphic of both both elbows where should they be in both in the dominant and non-dominant hands yeah so it's the same for the forehand and backhand right so if i'm in my ready position we pull that comment down just from just, can you, you can see her. just so they yeah. can see my elbows here so in my ready position, I have the racket away from my body, not all the way out, but I want the racket away from my body and my elbows out. And this kind of is like gonna, you're hugging a beach ball. Yeah. And that's what we, we talk about the beach ball all the time, beach ball spacing. Have you seen and, my beach ball? <laughs> and so the idea it's is that I would have a small beach ball to where when I move to the forehand, you can see that spacing between my elbows. When I move to the backhand, you can see the spacing. It's a little bit smaller in the backhand just naturally because I'm, I'm reaching across my body. But I 100% want my elbows away from my body, as you can see here. This is going to be really problematic and really going to mess up the, uh, the swing path and the joint position on the stroke. Wilson, tension can create lots of problems here, as you can imagine, right? When we get tense, the first thing that starts to happen is our elbows start to fold in towards our body. So if you feel like you're in a match and you're struggling with nerves and you're not hitting your backhand well as a result... <laughs> One of the easiest things to think about is relaxing your hands and creating that space with your elbows because um, it just sort of untenses. Like we all start to turn into a little T-Rex when we get nervous with our arms all folded in tight. So if you can relax, release your elbows, relax the tension in your hand, that's going to help with the nerves a ton as well. And just to clarify this, uh, I think this can be confusing. Like if you're looking at Novak in this picture, it's it's hard to distinguish his shirt in the back blue wall, but if you... He's got a lot of space there. Yeah. So this is actually the space between his elbow and, and his shirt. Yep. Watching this, and you're like, well, hold on. Novak's got his elbow pretty tight. It's just it's the, no, the he's, angle. He's wide. And the blue. There's a lot of blue in this There's particular blue video. Yeah. 
Does that help, man? Yes. Yeah, so the other question is, uh, you answer when the there's a low ball, but what do you do when it's a shorter level ball or higher, and you have a double handed backhand, which is not difficult for me. I'm five four, so basically every single ball that I strike is short. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. You, you and me. Yes. So, go for it. It's yeah, a little bit harder to do the, the motion up and down and such. How do you tackle those balls? So we talked about this actually in a video we just filmed Thursday. Talking about plowing through the back of the ball. You're always going to impart spin on the ball. It's very difficult to hit a true flat backhand. We're going to think about flattening it out in the sense that your swing path is just more on you know a line than it is coming up a ramp. Um but you still are going to generate top spin on the back of the ball as you're driving through it. Just be careful, as Nate said, not to hood the ball, right? So you're going to think almost more like a slap, but still with your normal grip, it's going to impart some top spin on the ball. And as you get closer to the net and that ball's up high, you can even almost swing down on it a little bit, right? So as, as the, um, the height of the ball gets higher and your distance to the net gets shorter, the trajectory in which you can swing down on the ball and have it still be effective um, – is more realistic. So if you're pushed back on the baseline, we're just trying to drive through it, create some good height over the ball. It's it's no longer low to high, right? right. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, of course. Thanks for tuning in, man. All right. That is all I've got in plus right now. So I will head back over here to the Facebooks and the YouTubes here. So give me a second here. I need to play catch up. Uh, we talked to Giovanni about leaving a gap between the hands. Um, we talked to Sean about how important it is to keep the racket tip up and above the waist. We just talked to Hilton about separating the elbow and the body on the backswing. Um, this is a great question from RK. So RK says, is the swing path to the ball more inside out? Do you want to address this one? Yeah, um, I, I think it's... A lot of it's targeting dependent. Yeah, so like if I'm working, it, it can be from the center of the court or slightly center from the court. But if I'm pulled out wide to the court, let me see if I can find. This is a pretty good one. I don't know. That's sorry. That's I'm still pretty in the center. Let me see if I can find one where he's pulled way out wide. I know we had one just a moment ago. Just back it up. Yeah. All right. So what you're gonna find here? Now this is dead on the run. This is super open stance. But when the ball is on the outside of the court, so if you imagine like a single sideline, that's a really big line. So a single sideline working from here. When the ball is on these outer thirds, you're actually as a righty going to be playing much more to like 7 o'clock to 2 o'clock. You're going to have to come more on the outside of the ball in order to get the ball back on a cross court, which is advantageous. If you're pulled way out here on the outer thirds, you obviously don't want to be going down the line. You could play a little bit more to middle, but you want to be finding your opponent's back end, assuming that they're also a righty here. So from there, it's seven to, seven to two. Now, the inside end, what you're talking about is like when the ball is in the middle of the court, I will swing a little bit more out to get the ball to wrap around. So that idea is pretty good and definitely on a return of serve. So for from, sure, on the deuce side in particular, yeah. as a righty, you're hitting that inside out. Um, you know, playing back to a righty's forehand. But if, if you get pulled into the middle of the court and you're getting that backhand, it's it's all options are available, right? You're allowed to redirect yeah. that line, and that would be more inside out, right? And uh, Yeah, and I think to clarify for the audience, the reason it feels inside out, let me go back to where he gets one a little bit more middle, is that this is a good image here. You can see the butt cap isn't facing the ball. Let me zero back well, and look at his Look at his hips and feet and the line they're creating yeah. too, right? His whole body's... So, two things to look at one is his shoulder he's got his shoulder more close towards the ball so it does feel like it's inside out and then what you're going to see here is the slot his hands people talk about flashlight point the flashlight at the ball his grip is actually going this way a little bit more to the side than it is actually to the ball and that's the inside out aspect that um that rk is talking about yeah okay hopefully that helps um plus members if you have anything else throw your questions in chat and we'll unmute you you guys know you are our priority um in the meantime here a couple other folks from youtube i'm we're trying to get to all of you guys i promise um sean says i'll pull this one up how do you keep the great frame in motion when it's a low incoming shot and you have to get down to it any tips we kind of talked about this with the reef already and that back leg and you know what the racket's inherently going to do when you get low 
Do you want to just give a quick summary there? I think we've actually already covered this even since he asked it, but maybe just a one sentence summary. Yeah. So what the question was earlier, what actually was being described is a coach getting that back leg down. When you get a low ball, the, the goal is to stay low. So if you can focus, not your front knee, but if you can focus on getting your back knee down to the ball here, we see Djokovic's knee down. So on a low ball, let me clear the rest of this. Almost in like a lunge position, right? Yep. Yep. So the lower the ball, like you've got to move up to that ball, focus on getting that back knee down. And no matter what, see where his rocket is here, the rocket's going to be down. If the, the knee's facing down the back, the rocket's going to drop. Yeah, so it would feel weird to bend and then go up. You would have two forces sort of right. fighting each other. And if right? it's super, super low, you're going to have to chip. All right, Alexander. What's up, Alexander? Is asking us which muscles are responsible for a swing. Shoulders, hands, knee bones connected to the elbow. Yeah, I don't know the rest of the words. But, Sounds um, like a kinesiology question, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's the kinetic chain, right? It's a little bit of everything. I know that's not a very useful answer for Alexander, but – we talk about initiating yeah. with the hands. Yep. So the, the hands may initiate, but ultimately it's the torque. It's the coil here. Let me go back for just a second. So as Novak is moving out to the ball right here, the legs are loading energy down, but importantly is his torso and shoulders are coiling. And so as he's coiling, his torso, his obliques, especially as they really expand back, as the weight begins to shift forward, it creates this momentum back out to the ball as the shoulders and hips uncoil, right? So it's a little bit of everything. I, I wouldn't think a ton about shoulders or, or your scapula. Are there certain things happening to keep everything stabilized? 100%. But focus about really coiling your upper body and using your legs to push down to load, and then everything's going to happen naturally. Your hands should feel super light here. I there think shouldn't a, be a good comparison. You do this all the time when we have students in town. Um, we'll grab the medicine balls and medicine ball twist and throws because you have yeah. to activate your legs. You have to activate your core. Your hands have to stay loose. You're not going to squeeze the ball or you won't let go of it. So think about taking a medicine ball, coiling up 90 degrees, and then trying to throw it as hard as you can at somebody. Those are all the same muscles you're going to activate. And, and like Nate said, I mean, everything but basically your face and your eyebrows and your hair. Are, are getting in, and your hair relaxed. are getting yeah. involved. Uh, and this. So hopefully that helps, Alexander. That's a good call with medicine ball. I mean, that's a perfect. If you want to know, get a feeling for how it should work, the medicine ball is it. it. Yep, that's the drill. All righty, moving right along here. RK, I like this question uh, because it's hard. I'm going to make Nate answer it. Um, the Novak follow through after contact, his racket stays square well into the follow through. He's saying when he uses his follow through, it's the back fence, which I don't recommend. Um, Murray is. Murray closes in the follow through pros or cons. So basically if you've got to pick one, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't if you're not close Gumby. Yeah. Murray's the answer usually. Right. I well, mean, I Joe wouldn't, uh, but Murray's unique because like we were talking about that seven to two Murray Murray, because he's so straight armed, he tends to work really on the outside of the ball as he's working through. So it's a little bit unique. I just, I, I think what I've had experience with even like the, the high performance kids and all that, if they, start trying to close the face. They're, they're not getting enough spin. They're hitting down on the ball. Now, if you're consistently taking it on the rise and your timing's good, fantastic, go after it. What I would suggest is if you're having a hard time with the Novak finish, I would follow through like Scott. Yep. Yep. So Scott follows through. Well, you show him. You know what your follow through looks like. Yeah, it's honestly kind of basic as a rec level player, and it's very hard to do in this Super uh, basic. very small area. It's not nice. Um, it's basically just... Think about listening to the knuckles on your left hand as a right-handed player, right? Answer the phone. So answer the phone. I'm going to make sure both of my elbows are up in the air. I'm going to make sure my left hand, my knuckles are tight by my ear. And I'm even thinking about having this racket come down and hit me dead between the two shoulder blades on my back, right? This ensures that I'm really extending out through the ball and ensures I'm getting up and lifting the ball. And it ensures I'm going to get that power because I'm not deselling if I'm whipping around and hitting my back at the end. One thing to add to that is, RK, watch Djokovic's foot here at the end. So see how like here it's on its toe. And as he comes around, he's going to pivot. And as this foot, if this foot didn't come around, let me get a different color. That's really hard to see. If this foot didn't come around as it does here, he wouldn't be able to sink the racket into that position right there. 
Okay, so make sure that you're pivoting on the finish as well when necessary. If it's not a ton of torque, if you're not being pulled really far wide, you can just come up to the toe. It's solid. Guys, do me a favor. We're going to keep jumping into more questions here. Do me a favor. For those of you on the wonderful world of Instagram, open up your phone right now and go to at play your court official. For the entire month of November, we are giving something away every single day just to the people that are following our page there. We just launched a new page, launching new content. It would be crazy for you not to jump in there. You'll see a bunch of behind the scenes stuff. If you follow Nate and my personal pages, you'll see all the stuff that uh, wasn't professional enough to make to the player court page. So go check that out. Make sure you get uh, engaged and you've got a chance to win some pretty cool stuff. So go check that out. Type done in the chat once you've opened up your phone, snagged Instagram, and wrote in at player court official and followed the page. Well done. Man, I got rocks in my mouth yeah. today. I was worried about you there. All right. Uh, you make me nervous. <laughs> um, you know who makes me nervous? Our wonderful brand head of media is standing right behind these cameras right now. And she's like, you look nervous today. I was like, I don't feel nervous, but now I'm nervous. Um, all right. Next question here. Sean, I think we kind of covered this, brother. The uh, How do you keep from dropping the inside shoulder just before contact to drive the ball? I'm going to do a one sentence cap there. We talked about it with the inside out piece. I'm not, I'm not quite following. What is he asking? I'll throw it up on the screen here. How do you keep from dropping the inside shoulder just before contact to drive the ball? So I'm not entirely against dropping the shoulder a little bit. So as you're working to get to the ball, it's okay that the shoulder drops a little bit because if you watch my hands, as the shoulder drops a little bit, it raises the racket up and helps pronounce that drop. Now, if your shoulder works under your chin, like we talked about earlier, as long as it stays under the chin, your head will actually make this happen. It's the same thing on a one-handed backhand. If I'm hitting a one-handed backhand from here, as my chin dips, you can see there, it also drives the shoulder. Now, if you're getting separation to where the shoulder's dipping and the head's up, something's, it, there's a big imbalance there. But just if you make a correlation between your hitting shoulder, your, your dominant shoulder, and your chin, it almost happened. It, it, it's really it's difficult to drop it necessarily wrong yeah. either, right? Like that's the big takeaway here. A little bit is okay. A little bit, but okay. it should occur with the chin, not your shoulder. Cool, cool. I like how to grab my chin in case no one knew that was my chin. <laughs> that's my chin. Um, Wilson says, if I have to be throwing medicine balls, I'm not going to come train with you guys. We we <laughs> we we eat candy too. We we eat candy also. That's right. Pizza and beer for lunch. Yeah, it's a very healthy uh, couple days. All right, Anthony. Not really, but we could if you wanted to. That's right. Anthony asks, on the run, I tend to have my right leg back as if I'm reaching. Is that just because my footwork is late? Anthony, I'm going to assume you're right-handed. Tend to have my right leg back. I'm not sure I follow. You understand the question? Yeah, I'm just assuming if you're stepping in with your left foot, that's a no-no. That's the only way I can think of that the right leg is actually back is that you're stepping out with the left. Um, now, if – what we saw a moment ago with Djokovic completely dead on the run. If you're hitting an open stance backhand from the outer thirds, then the back leg may be out a little bit and you may actually have to step with the left foot. But I think what's happening, we see this with, with, with our students quite a bit is that they get a ball and they actually step in with their left, right? You're not stepping in, you're stepping out. Yeah, that's true. Cause you lose all the power of weight transition. If you're just yeah. setting yourself off of that left foot. Out Can't load the yeah. hips. All right, Anthony, hopefully that helps. He says he's a right-handed player. We got that right. Good to know. Um, one for one. One for one. Um, feel free to throw any more questions you have in here, guys. We'll go for about five more minutes, and then we got to get back to running the biggest, best tennis community in the world, I suppose. Um, also, for those of you trying to figure out, like, hey, when are these live streams? This just showed up on my YouTube feed. If you're a player court member, it's only eight bucks a month. Um, Pair you with evenly matched players for practice and matches. There's video content, deals and discounts from all of our major partners. But you'll see on your main Play Your Court membership dashboard a list of events, right? It talks about um, these live streams. It talks about an unbelievable party. Yes, a party that we are throwing for our Play Your Court Plus members at an Indian Wells in March. So make sure you keep your eyes peeled for that. But yeah, if you're, if you're inside the Play Your Court community, you go inside your dashboard. That's where you'll see where all these are. We've got one coming up in December. Uh, talking about serving and volleying, I believe. So that should be exciting. That is the next one, yeah. Should be exciting. All right, last couple questions here. Um, 
we covered this sort of, but I'll, I'll let you really clarify here to make sure this rings clear. So what is the best power position Pranav wants to know? Yeah, I'll just, I'll show it to you real quick. All right, so it's right here, right? And what we're gonna see, one shoulder underneath the chin, head level, but most importantly, we have the racket above the hands, right? This is just the important piece. The power position is really making sure that racket is staying above the hands so it has the ability to drop and work out to the ball. Boom. All right, so that's what we're referring to. You know, a lot of different strokes have power positions, but you know, in the forehand, it's the same thing with the racket loaded up here. That's what we're trying to focus on. We're just trying to create that leverage with the racket up. Cool. I like it. For now, hopefully that helps. A couple plus questions. Uh, Wilson, my man, I'm going to ask you to unmute again. I'm so relieved that uh, it's Wilson and not whatever name I was trying to pronounce here on, on Zoom. That's my last name. My initial name, my last name. Okay, got it. There uh, we go. That it, makes sense. It. All right, cool. Um, so you were asking about the disguising a drop shot with a two-handed backhand. So the good news is your bottom hand, as we discussed, is already your continental grip. Right. So that's the grip you would you would use to hit a drop shot. So you don't have to change your bottom hand at all. The question that I would have for you is in your ready position, are you up in the throat or are you more down here? Because that's halfway in the neck area. Halfway in the neck area. So that's even better, right? You don't have to like this is if I was gonna set up to hit a drop shot without disguising it, I would start just like I would a backhand volley with my left hand on the throat and my bottom hand in continental grip. So it sounds like maybe you're more like right here. So from right here, I mean, you can go right into the drop shot. So all you're really going to do is pull that racket back as if you're going to hit a two-hander and then just at the last second. I mean, you've already got the grip in play, right? The disguise is just to not show your cards too soon. You just don't want to slide way up or show a big slice too early. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the disguise is, is really just not showing your cards until it's time to actually make contact with the ball. If you watched um, – did you watch, by chance, the, the Paris final, uh, Novak and Medvedev? Yes. He was Djokovic was drop shotting like crazy, wasn't he? It was yes. a, it was a really good tactic and it's not one that we've seen somebody come out and deploy against Medvedev, but uh interesting to try to get him off the baseline. And and Novak like he he definitely was doing it's more advanced. We don't see it quite as much recreationally, but he was actually going into his backhand and loading from here and then sliding the hand up. So he was from here and then sliding up into that drop shot. But it still has the the unit turn, so it looks like he's getting ready to drive. And then all of a sudden, as the hand comes up, he works through the slice. So that would be the only way to make it a little bit more um, disguised. But th that's – and then situational, like feet yeah. inside the baseline, opponent behind the baseline. That's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the best disguise is recognizing your opponent's out of position and doing it at the right time, right? If, if you've hit a really aggressive shot that's pulled your opponent out of position or really far off the baseline, and they're scrambling just to try and get to that ball – they're not going to have as many, you know, as much focus on you and what you're doing. So the disguise doesn't have to be as good if you're using it at the right time. Just keep that in mind as well. And, and one last question. Uh, when do you start doing uh, transition from the ready position to the unit term? When the ball is coming across the net, when it's bouncing, when, when do you are doing this turn? Uh, so let's let, let's take There's a step back here. Conflicting guidance here depending <laughs> on skill levels. I'll yeah. let you go first. Well, I, I, would, just, I would ask, when are you split stepping? Uh, usually when I see the ball coming across the net. Okay, so a little bit late. So ideally, if we can get, get you in the habit to where as soon as you see your opponent getting ready to make contact, and, and that's when we want to hit our splits. Because we don't have to know whether it's going to a forehand or backhand, but it's just before they make contact, hit that split step. And so that way, as the ball, as the ball reaches the net, you've actually hit the ground load it, you spring load it, right? You hit the ground and you're able to quickly move into that direction. And so from there, it's more about the split step than what you're doing with the hands. And so once you you hit the ground, that's when you go into your unit turn. I split and then I go. So regardless of where I'm going, my feet hit the ground, I unit turn. That's going to feel natural too, because if you do this correctly, you could even split step thinking about throwing all of your weight on your toes, where if you didn't move in a direction, you would literally fall flat on your face. And if you do that, it's going to be very natural to figure out whether you're going to forehand or backhand, and it's going to be very natural to start that unit turn as you do it. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Very welcome. 
All right, we're going to field one more question from a plus member here, and then we are going to bid you guys adieu here. I see a disturbing lack of people typing done in the chat from having gone over to our Instagram and oh, following at sad. Play Your Court Official to win free stuff from us. We're just trying to give you some love in November. Go follow that account. We gave away us. a lifetime membership the other day. We give away cool I was stuff shocked by that. Too. Forever, like your entire life. I Day one, I mean, she, so years. next week we're going to be in Indian Wells doing a serve workshop. Gave a seat away to that, 1200 bucks. Yeah, there's some cool stuff happening. You, spit my you deserved it. <laughs> All right. Um, Randall on plus, let me unmute you, my man. I have asked you to unmute. Great. Thank you. Hey, what's going what's on, happening, Randall? Happy Tuesday. How are we doing? Yeah, good. You know, I can usually follow your techniques and when I'm practicing or hitting it against the ball machine, but then when things start to go slightly wrong or really wrong in a match, I don't want to think about, oh my God, there are six things I need to look at to correct. Do you guys have a progression, a checklist for progression? If, if you begin to hit long, let's first focus on the unit turn, the racket head uh, position, the is there a checklist that you would go through rather than forcing me to think about the 15 or 20 different things yeah. that I'm supposed to be doing? So what you're suffering from is what we refer to as paralysis, paralysis? by analysis. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's impossible, right? We're playing a sitting and receiving sport that moves very, very fast. So when you're going through your checkpoints and you're working on technique, you really want to do that on a practice court. So whether you're doing it with a coach, you're doing it with a ball machine or a buddy, that's where you're going to make those kind of gains where you're going to work technically and then when you get on the court you've really got to focus on the sending receiving aspect and you can focus on kind of one thing like maybe per stroke but it's not it's even become more complicated than that where it's like maybe on the forehand i'm focusing on a high finish and then i get a volley and i'm focusing on pointing the the, the racket tip it's, it's all just happening too fast right so what we try to tell players when they're competing is focus on what's happening in front of you and never behind you because if you start thinking about like where your swing is behind you, where your elbow is, where your foot is, all that good stuff, you're going to be late because you're not really tracking the ball. Put your attention to maybe keeping the head still, maybe to, to keeping contact out in front, to finishing and really focusing on getting that hitting elbow all the way up. Same thing with the backhand. Those are kind of the intangibles where it's like if you finish correctly, um, the chances of everything else going correct through the stroke are much, much higher, but you're never going to hit. I don't even for myself, if I'm working on something, I'm never going to hit the six bullets in a stroke. So I just want to take the most important one and hope the rest of them connect the dots. Yeah. I mean, Randall, think about studying for a test in high school when, when it's time to take the test, not a whole lot more you're going to learn by trying to cram at the last second. Right? So when you walk out on the court, You've got all the information in your head there. The idea that Nate talks about by trying to analyze, you know, the seven different things that could be going wrong in a heat of battle, not really the time for that. Like he said, try and find one specific thing. Like for me on my serve, for example, if my serve's going haywire, I know I know how to serve. I just need to think about one small piece of it. Maybe, maybe it's my stance, maybe it's my toss, but just something to trigger the brain to get back into that flow that we already understand subconsciously. So you shouldn't be, you know, breaking your strokes down and putting them back together in the middle of a match. If you feel like you really had a bad day, that's certainly something you can do um, with progressions on the practice court. But, but yeah, I would agree with Nate there. All right. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And sure. be nice to yourself. It takes at least three months to make a change, right? right. Like it's, it's difficult. So if, it's, if you're taking steps back, all good, man. Just keep at it. You'll yeah. get it. Enjoy the process. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, that is all we have for you today. Thank you guys for tuning in into this live stream again. If you could and you haven't already, Head on over to our Instagram page, at Play Your Court Official. Make sure you follow that. We are giving something cool away every single day in November. So we'd love to have you guys there. And if you're not for some reason inside the Play Your Court membership, we've made it basically free at this point. So go check yeah. that out as well, playyourcourt.com. What are we giving away tomorrow? Let's throw a teaser out there. Monica, what are we giving away tomorrow? I'll put her on the spot. Put Kenny, her on the spot. what are we giving spot. away tomorrow? <laughs> a car? A car. <laughs> Kenny's car. Guys, tomorrow we're giving away. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. Oh, look at this. And we're even all branded up. So tomorrow, yeah. maybe this will be better incentive. Tomorrow, we are giving away a Wilson custom racket, meaning you go to Wilson.com. Yep. Hand me that. Made my own Ooh. pretty one. Look how That's scared insane. she was. Like, I'm not going to go on camera. <laughs> just, just the racket. So Wilson custom racket. I play with the Fed. You guys are familiar. He's pretty good at tennis. 
This is that, but with my own custom colors. So you can literally go on wilson.com. You can pick out a wide array of colors and mix and match. I ended up with camo and lava red. I think it's pretty sweet. Put my name right here. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we're giving away tomorrow for literally just following our Instagram page, saying nice things about Nate. I have thick skin. I can take the mean comments. It's fine. <laughs> but go check that out at Player Court Official. Uh, and we will see you guys on the next live stream in December. That's right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Happy Tuesday. See you soon.